Okay, so we've covered the first two sections of chapter three. Let's cover the last section of, of week three here. This is measures of position. Remember we talked about that bell curve. And the bell curve, so far we've, met, we've uh, talked about measures of center. That's just locating the center at what value it is along this number line down here. Measures of spread, which just tell us how wide that curve is, comparing a curve like this to one that might be like this. It's much narrower. Obviously, the black curve has a wider spread than the brown curve does. So now we're looking at measures of both of those, um, center and spread. Describe the whole distribution. That's all the values and how they fit together. So we start talking about measures of position now. Now we're talking about individual values. But not just individual values, but how they fall in relation to that whole distribution. So it, it is kind of descriptive of the distribution because we need to know that information about the distribution to find the position. So here we're going to look at z-scores. Um, we're going to look at percentiles of the data, quartiles. Then we'll look at, since we're dealing with quartiles, we'll look at five number summaries and find effective outliers. Um, we'll find outliers and then how they affect it. We've already seen the outliers a little bit, the extreme values, when we do the mean and how it, the mean is less resistant to those values than the median is. And we'll look at a box plot. So let's look at z-scores first. A z-score is simply found by doing a number minus a mean, then divided by the standard deviation. So we need to know the mean and standard deviation of a population or group that we're taking it from before we can find the z-score for a number. For example, let's say you are evaluating an employee, and you have an employee that has sold for sales. Let's say their sales is $12,000 for the week. Well, to evaluate them, well, is that good or bad? Well, we need to compare to what's everybody else doing. So let's say for all your salespeople, you have a mean sales of $15,000 and the standard deviation in their sales of $1,500. Now the z-score for this person then would be their sales of $12,000 minus the mean for that whole population, for that whole group of $15,000. That'll be divided by the standard deviation for that whole group or the whole population of $1,500. Now when we subtract here, 12,000 minus 15,000, and it is going to be a negative 3,000. We do have to keep the negative on there. Divided by that standard deviation of 1,500. We divide that out, that is a negative 2. Now, since that's negative, that means it is below the mean or less than the mean. Positive would mean it is above the mean or larger than the mean. So the fact that this is negative means their, their sales is below the mean or below average. Two standard deviate, negative two means it's two standard deviations below. So if we're thinking about that bell curve, if we're thinking about that empirical rule, for one, two, the mean of course is in the middle, then one, two standard deviations, that'd be negative two there. That's two standard deviations below. Now, if you remember, the empirical rule showed us that two standard deviations each way, we were expecting about 95% of the data to be between those two. So outside would be 5%. 100 minus 95 would be 5%. Since this is symmetrical, that means 2.5% on each end. So for this salesperson to have a z-score of negative 2 is telling us that only 2.5% of salespeople did worse than that person. Or we would only expect about 2.5% of salespeople 
to do worse than that in a given period. So, here we're, what the z-score does is it compares each value back to its population. So what it's really useful is when we're comparing two things that come from different populations. Here we're talking about a man who is 73 inches tall and a woman who is 68 inches tall. Obviously, men and women are different heights on average. So comparing the man's height to the woman's height is not quite a fair comparison. But we can compare them back to their own population and compare how they relate to their own population. And we can do that through a z-score. So let's say that we have, for the man, the 73-inch man, the z-score. His height is 73. They give, I really have to go through the next slide, it looks like to give the, the mean. So here's just defining the z-score again. It's the value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So here now they're giving that mean and standard deviation for men and women. So the mean height for an adult, adult man in the U.S. is 69.4, standard deviation of 3.1. So that man, the z-score for the man, is 73 inches of height minus 69.4 divided by the standard deviation of 3.1. So again, the 73 was our value from up here. Oops. From up here, 73 inches tall. The 69.4 was the mean height of men, and the 3.1 is the standard deviation of men, men's height. So now we can subtract 73 minus 69.4 is 3.6 divided by 3.1. So 3.6 divided by 3.1 gives us 1.6, or 1.1612. Usually we go to two decimal places for z-scores, so 1.16. So that is saying that this man is 1.16 standard deviations greater than the mean height for men. It's positive, so that means it's, he's larger than, or he's above the mean. Now let's look at for the woman. Z score for the woman. The woman was 68 inches tall minus the mean for women is 63.8. The standard deviation for women is 2.8. So now we are going to subtract 68 minus 63.8 is 4.2 inches divided by 2.8, which is going to give us 1.5. 1 1.50 is one of those steps. So that is saying that that woman is one and a half standard deviations greater than the mean for all women. So which one is actually larger relative to their own population? The woman's height of 68 inches is, is much larger, is considerably larger compared to the rest of the women than the man is of 73 inches compared to the rest of men. So again, this is just showing out the calculations and comparing that the man's height, is, the woman's height is larger compared to her population. So this is, remember, referring back to that empirical rule. So for in this case, the man's height of 1.16 is going to be somewhere in here. The woman's height of 1.5 is somewhere in here. So actually, and that's what I said before, that one, that the example I did before where the z-score came out to be exactly negative 2, you can use the empirical rule to estimate probabilities and percents. Here, since the, you know, both of these z-scores, 1.16 and 1.5, fell you know, between the, the integers, the 1s and 2 standard deviations, we really can't come up with percents, but we can put them on the graph and see you know, that this one here that's highlighted the woman's height is definitely further up the curve than the man's height was. Next, we want to compute percentiles. Percentiles are really saying what percent of data is smaller than this value. So you may get percentiles with your children's testing at school. Let's say your, your child tested in the 91st percentile. What does that mean? Well, that means that 91% of children 
tested lower than your child on that particular attribute. So percentiles here, looking at numbers between 1 and 99. Now, you can't be 100 percentile because you can't have 100 percentile. You'd, you'd, 100 percentile would be you are the top score, period. Nobody else is ever greater than you and possibly could be greater than you. And of course, that's not very likely. So we go between 1 and 99. Following the procedure for computing the percentile for data. Or arrange the data in order from increasing order. So now just like when we did the median, we have to put the data in order from smallest to largest. It's very important. Increasing order. So smallest first, largest last. Next, we've got to figure out the position. So we're going to take, this is saying take P divided by 100 times N. N, remember, is the size of the list. Or number of items in the list. Size of the group, number of items in the group, however you want to describe it. P over 100, that's just saying if I want the 85th percentile, we just change that to a decimal, we use 0.85. So you do 85 over 100, or you could just do 0.85. And that gives you the position of it. Now that you have that position, just like with the the mean and the median, sorry, it's just like with the median, if it comes out to be a whole number, it's between that number and the next one. If it comes out to be a decimal, you just round it up and it's that next position. So if L is a whole number, it is the average of that position and the next one. Okay? If L is not a whole number, you round up to the next highest whole number and that's the position of the percentile. So here are our numbers right here. We want to compute the 30th percentile. Well, the first thing we have to do is put them in order from smallest to largest. So on this next slide, that's hoping what they did. Yes, they put them in order from smallest to largest. Now, n equals 42 here. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Times 3 is 42. So n equals 42. So for position, I'm going to take 0.3, which is 30% as a decimal, times 42, which is going to give me 12.6. You can see they did that here. Instead of doing 0.3, they did 30 over 100. Same thing. 12.6. Now remember, there's two possibilities. If this comes out to be a whole number, which this one did not, if it were a whole number, it would be between that position and the next one. Since this is a decimal, we round up. And we're looking at the 13th position in the list. That's what we're saying here. Since it is a not a whole number, since it's a decimal, we round up to the next digit. Even if that was 12.1, we would still round up to the next place. It's always round up, never round down. So the 13th number in the list is 1.22. That is the 30th percentile of this list. So let's do another one. Let's say I wanted to find the 60th percentile, or 65th percentile. So I'm going to take 0.65 times 42. Give me 27.3. Now again, that's a decimal. Even though it's 0.3, we still round it up. So we're going to take the 28th number in the list. So if I count up, 28th number is right here, 4.37. So the 65th percentile is 4.37. So what if I do, what if I want to find the 50th percentile? Well, I'm going to find the position. I'm going to take 0.5, that's 50% as a decimal, or 50 over 100, either way, times 42, and I'm going to get 21. Now, since this is a whole number, that means I'm looking between the 21st and 22nd number. 
So let's see, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. There's the 21st and there's the 22nd number. So my 50th percentile is 2.84 plus 3.06 divided by 2, which will come out to be 2.95. Remember, when you add these together, you type in 2.84 plus 3.06, hit equals before you hit divided by 2. So 2.95 is your 50th percentile. Your 50th percentile, by the way, is also your median. So what if I want to find the percentile that corresponds to a given value? In other words, this value is in a certain percentile. So what you're going to do is you arrange the data in increasing order. Let x be the data value whose percentile is to be computed. And then we're going to use the following formula. Now this formula here implies that there's no repeated values. Um, I'm going to add just a little bit to this formula here. The formula, the percentile, is really 100 times. On top it's the number that are less plus 1 half times the number that are equal. Or 0 0.5 times the number they're equal. They put the 0 0.5 here. Well, they're assuming there's no repeated values. But if that value is repeated, we should take 0 0.5 times how many times that, that particular value is repeated. Now, if that value isn't even in the list, we still do the 0.5, however. Over the total number in the data set. So over the total number. And we round this result to the nearest integer. This is your percentile. Percentiles are never given as a decimal. They're always given as an integer percent. Let's look at an example here. 1989, rainfall in Los Angeles during the month of February was 1.9 inches. What percentile does this correspond to? So we need to find the rainfall for other months. So this is the rainfall for 42 months, as we were given before. We did put it in order from smallest to largest already. So we're looking at 1.9 is right here. How many are smaller? Well, it's 14, 15, 16, 17 that are smaller. 0.5, because there's only one that's equal. So 17 plus 0.5, that would be 17.5 over 42. Now, I, for some reason, I always divide that out before I multiply by 100. So 17.5 divided by 42 is 0.4166. So 0.4166. It's 41.66 or 0.67 percent, so that's 42 percent. So that is the 42nd percentile. Now, in this case, there are no numbers that are repeated, so this would always be 0.5 here. But you got to remember, if they're repeated, that's 0.5 times the number that are equal. Like I said, right there. Let's compute quartiles. Well, quartiles cut the data into three or into four sections. Into four quarters. Now, if you think about it, let's say you have a piece of string and you need to cut it into four pieces. How many cuts do you need to make? We only need to make three cuts, so there are only three quartiles. There's the first quartile, there's the second quartile, which is the same as the median, and then there's the third quartile, sometimes called the lower quartile, of course this is still the median, and the upper quartile. Abbreviations, of course, Q1 for, lower, for first quartile, Q3 for the third quartile, um, Q2 can be sometimes used for median, but usually we just call it the median. Now, if you look at this, these will correspond to percentiles. The first quartile is just the 25th percentile. The median, as we already saw, the median is simply the 50th percentile. And the third quartile is simply going to be the 75th percentile. 
So let's take a look. And here we see it. It takes the, the Q1 separates the lowest 25% of the data from the highest 25%. In other words, it's larger than 25% of the data. So it is the 25th percentile. Second quartile separates the lower 50% from the upper 50%. Again, it's the 50th percentile. Third quartile is again the 75th percentile. Separates the lower 75% from the upper 25%. So let's find the quartiles for this data set. Well, we're going to take 25th percentile, 0.25 or 25 over 100, times 42 is 10.5. That means that's going to be the 11th position. So the 11th position is right there. 0.67 is the first quartile. Right here. This here, for the third quartile, we do 75 over 100, or 0.75 times 42, gives us 35.1. So 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, oops, 31, 31.5, I should say. So again, that's going to be the 32nd position. So it's 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. So 5.54 is the third quartile. Now this works just like it did with the median and just like it did with the percentiles. If we happen to get an integer here, it's between that value and the next one. Both of these came out to decimals. And it's very common for them to come out to decimals. Unless you have you know, something, uh, n, the sample size of n that's divisible by 4, they're going to come out to decimals. So you always round up just like you do with percentiles. Now I didn't find the median here, but the second quartile is just the median. And we found that before the median was between the 2.84 and the 3.06. In the graphing calculator, I'm not going to put this whole data set in the graphing calculator, but I am going to do a set first. You're going to go stat. Let me start this over. You hit stat. Then your edit menu, you're going to select edit again. Now I've got lists in here, so I'm going to clear them out. So I'm going to go up to L2, clear and enter, clears out the whole list. L1, highlight L1, clear and enter, clears out that whole list. Now I'm going to enter some of these numbers. Um, so, 0 0.00, 0 0.08, 0 0.11, 0 0.13, 0 0.14, 0 0.17. This is really the hardest part of dealing with the graphing calculator is entering the numbers. If you have a data cable, um, some of the data files do come with the textbook. You can download some of the data files. So I want to just stop at 1.3 here. This is the first 14 numbers in the data set. Notice I'm on L15, so I would, the, next, the next number I entered would be the 15th number. So I'm going to stop there, L14. So I'm going to quit to go back to my home screen. Just a second quit goes back to my home screen here. And let's say I want to find the quartiles for this. Now again, these are for the whole data set, which we just found. So I'm finding this a little bit different. So I'm going to do stat, run over to calc, one variable stats. Now I'm, it's just using L1, so I'm just going to click it. I don't need to enter anything in there. It always assumes it's L1 if I don't put anything in. So here it finds my mean, 0.435. Those are all the other stuff. Standard deviation, since this is a sample, would be 0.416. If it had been a population, it would be different. And there's 14 numbers in the list. Smallest number was 0. First quartile for those 14 numbers is 0.13. Median of 0.26. Third quartile, 0.67. The largest number is 1.309. Did I put in 1.309? Oh, I did put in 1.30. It should be 1.30. Right? So that'll change a little bit. 
So let me uh, redo this. Stat, calc, one variable statistics. Hit enter again. Doesn't change it a whole lot. There's x bar. That's my mean. Standard deviation still 0.415 about. Doesn't really change my quartiles there. It's just my max is 1.3. That's what it should have been. So you can see the calculator spits out the quartiles and the median using that same one variable statistic function. Next, we're going to look at the five number summary. The five number summary is actually just what I have on the screen here. The minimum, first quartile, medium, third quartile, and the maximum. So the five number summary. Minimum, Q1, the median, Q3, and the max. Now there's some exceptions to this. The minimum and maximum may not be used if they're outliers. So we do exclude outliers. So we'll have to talk about outliers a little bit in this section. Now up until this point, we discussed outliers before. So we'd use the term back on our bell curve. We have the median, then one, two, three standard deviations below. One, two, three standard deviations above. And we had discussed outliers as being anything that was outside of that three standard deviations. An outlier could be more than three standard deviations below the mean or more than three standard deviations above the mean. In other words, look at what we use today. This would be a z-score of less than negative three. And this would be a z-score of greater than a positive three. Those would be outliers on the bell curve. We were talking about the five number summary and we're going to be looking at a box plot the whole idea of an outlier, there's another, there's a second way of finding outliers based upon that. So here it says our five number summary is the minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, and max. We've already done that for this one. We found the quartiles and we found the median. Smallest number is zero, largest number is 13.68. We do need to check to see if there are any outliers. So understand the effects of outliers. First, we need to check for outliers. So that's where we're going to go next. To do our outliers, we're going to have to define something called interquartile range. The interquartile range, which from now on you'll see me abbreviate as IQR, is the third quartile minus the first quartile. So for this data set, let it go. Right here. The interquartile range is going to be between these two. So it would be 5.54 minus 0.67, which is going to be 4.87. That's our interquartile range, IQR. So anyway, an outlier is a value that is considerably larger or considerably smaller than the rest of the value. We discussed that before. Or outside of an expected range. Some outliers result in errors. It may have been a misplaced decimal point. It may have been a, a poor measurement. So it may have been the value itself, the, the number might not be real. In which case we would not want to include it in the data set. That's why it would be much larger or much smaller than the other values. Some outliers are correct values, however. We just happen to have a really strange or really unusual occurrence that happened. Um, so that, that's the difference between an outlier and extreme value. Um, an extreme value is a number that's really small or really large compared to the other values, but it's actually a really va real value. An outlier, generally something you want to exclude, is usually the, the, the result of a mistake. Now, like I said, some outliers are just extreme values because they really are real real numbers, real data points. We have no way, once it's in the numbers, we have no way of distinguishing which is which, unfortunately. So we may have to exclude them either way. Um, the, the, the trick is, though, well, we're not going to exclude them unless it's so great that we almost have to. And we'll take a look at how we do that. So in this data set right here, we're measuring the for eight consecutive days during the summer, the temperature. So the, here's the readings in degrees Fahrenheit. So these are in chronological order, the date they occurred, it looks like. 
So there they are. So which reading is an outlier? Is or is there an outlier? Well, this one's actually pretty easy to see. 8 degrees, 8.45 degrees is pretty easily an outlier. That one's pretty easy to pick out. That should have been 84.5. The decimal point got put in the wrong place. That one obviously should be deleted because it's not a real value. There's no way it was 83.2 degrees one day, 8.45 degrees the next, and then up to 79.5 the next, the day after. It's just not, well, it's not impossible, but it's not very likely at all. So... We would exclude that one. We can't just assume that the decimal's in the wrong spot and move it back. We can't. So we have to delete that value completely. Because it may have been we missed a key. That might be 81.45. They may have missed a key when they entered it. So we don't know for sure. So this is talking about the interquartile range as we defined. The interquartile range is the third quartile minus the first quartile. So for a set, we find the quartiles, Q1 and Q3. Then we find that interquartile range. Now, from that, we calculate the lower boundary. The lower boundary is found by taking that interquartile range and multiplying it by 1.5. So that is going to give us a distance below our quartile, first quartile or above our third quartile right here. This will be a little more evident when I do an example. So if I take that 1.5 times my interquartile range, any data points that are more than that distance below the first quartile would be considered outliers, because that forms our lower boundary. Any values that are more than that distance above the third quartile would be considered outliers, because that, that creates our upper boundary of outliers. And of course, any values outside the boundaries are, as I said, outliers. So our next thing here, let's take a look at some values here. The following table presents the number of students absent in a middle school in northwestern, in northwestern Montana for each day in January 2008. Identify any outliers. Well, looking at here, well, the 100's a little high. wonder if there's a special event or something that happened on that day. Well, we can enter these in the calculator. Let's go ahead and do that. So stat, edit. I'm going to go to list one. I'm going to go up to L1. I'm going to hit clear and enter. So I'm going to put them in. 65, 67, 71, 57, 51, 49, 44, 41, 59, 49, 42, 56, 45, 77, 44, 42, 45, 46, 159, 53, 51. So that's 22 data points. So now I'm going to exit out of there. I'm going to stat. Calc, one variable statistics. Since it's just list one, there's no frequencies or anything in list two, I'm just going to hit enter. And now I'm going to arrow down. So Q1 is 45, Q3 is 59. So that means my interquartile range. 59 minus 45, which is 14. So that means 1.5 oops, times my interquartile range is going to equal 1.5 times 14, which is 21. So 21 is my distance to my boundaries from my quartiles. So my lower boundary. is going to be the first quartile, 45, minus that 1.5 times the interquartile range, so minus 21. That's going to be 24. Anything below 24 would be an outlier. There is nothing in this list below 24. My upper is going to be Q3, which is 59, plus that 1.5 interquartile range, which is the 21. 
Get 60, 80. Anything over 80 would be an outlier. That is my upper boundary. When I look at the list, there is the 100 that's over 80. So that is an outlier. Because it is outside the upper boundary. So it's showing my quartiles, 45 and 59. And it's calculating my boundaries. You get the same boundaries I just had up here, 24 and 80. So the 100 is found to be our only outlier. Constructing a box plot. Now with the data we just used, okay, the calculator here is going to tell us minimum of 41, maximum 100. So our five number summary here. 41 is our minimum. We had 45 was our first quartile. Median of 51. Come on now. 59 was our third quartile. Now 100 was our max, but that was outside of our upper boundary. So we're going to have to deal with that. Remember, 80 was our upper boundary. So we look at here, what happens? Well, this box plot here is showing um, two outliers on the upper side. So this is not the box plot for our data. But this here in this box plot, come on, this would be the minimum here. That's the smallest value. Now, the edges of our box are quartile 1 and quartile 3 are the edges of our box. This line in the center of our box is our median. And then this would normally be the maximum value, but you see this, the asterisks out here? Those are both outliers. So the whisker usually goes out to the minimum on one end and out to the maximum on the other end. But here, since our maximum, actually our two largest values in this case are outliers, our whisker stops short of that. Now some textbooks say that that whisker goes to the upper boundary. Others will say that whisker goes to the next largest value. So here, again, it's saying the outliers get plotted separately. And in this textbook, for our textbook here, we're saying we only go up to, since there's outliers on the upper ends, we go up to the upper outlier boundary. Or we need to find the largest value that is less than the upper outlier boundary. So what we're putting in here is the next largest value. So it's not the upper boundary. We're putting in the value that is closest to the upper boundary without going over. These are the values that are above the upper boundary are marked as outliers. This is the next value closest to the upper boundary. So here's our data again. Here's our quartiles. We found our inner quartile range. And we found our outliers. So we have a number line down here giving us our what each value means. Quartile 1 was 45. And the way I would normally do it is, is I actually just put in lines. I would put on my number line above the 45, I put in a vertical line there. 51 was my median, put in a vertical line above my median. 59 was my third quartile, put in a vertical line, and then I connect those lines to create the box like this. Now I know there is no outlier on the lower end, so I can just go down to my minimum value. You know, 24 is my lower boundary. That is meaningless to me because there are no outliers. I'm just going to draw a whisker down to my minimum value. On the upper end, there were outliers, so I can't draw my whisker up to my max. So on the upper end... Our upper boundary was 80, remember. The next lowest value in the data set that's below 80 is 77. So we draw that whisker from our third quartile up to 77, and we stop there. Even though 80 is the boundary, we stop at the next data, the first data value, or last data value, I should say, below that upper boundary. This is our upper boundary. So the, the last data value before that is 77. Now 100 is sitting up here. We're going to put an asterisk. I'm just going to use a star because I can't draw an asterisk real well. At 100 to mark that there is that outlier up there. Then, of course, we draw 
Our minimum value is 41. Again, the lower boundary of 24 is way below the minimum value. So we don't care about that lower boundary anymore. It's, it's no, not going to be any part of this box and whisker plot. Okay, so now I did the, they put the little X up here for the outlier, for the 100. Again, I use a star, asterisk, whatever. And so now, the box plot can determine the skewness of the data. When I look at a box plot, there are several possibilities. Um, first of all, remember, each section of the box plot contains one quarter of the data. See, those are the three, or the four different quarters, fourths of the data. This one's the smallest, which means that's saying the data is most tightly packed at that point. This one's the largest, is saying the data is most spread out at that point. So this is a very skewed set of data. The box plot for a bell curve, there's my bell curve, will look something like this. You can see it's tight in the middle. This section here is a little bit smaller than this section. Because the data is more spread out out here and it's much more congested together, much more uh, uh, tightly packed or closer together and concentrated in the middle. So the whiskers, this distance is longer than the distance from the center of the box up to the edge of the box, which makes sense. Skewed data, however, Looks like this. The box, of course, is going to be the median is going to be somewhere in here. There's this whisker we stretched out, and there might even be an outlier out here. It doesn't matter. But you can see here this whisker is much longer than the whisker on the other side. My pen isn't working very well for some reason here. So this whisker being longer than, than this one means it's skewed to the right, like it stretched out to the right. Now the mirror image would mean it was skewed to the left. So here, yes, they're showing skewed to the right. This whisker over on this side, the, the right-hand whisker is longer than the left-hand whisker, and possibly an outlier. There may not always be an outlier just because it's skewed. Here, this is skewed to the left. Again, this whisker is long, the left whisker is longer than the right whisker. And again, possibly outliers on the left side. This is a symmetrical curve, or approximately symmetrical curve, where the whiskers are about the same length on either side. The box sections are slightly smaller than the whiskers. Or... So what have we learned in this section? We found how to do z-scores, calculate z-scores, and interpret them. Z-scores are telling us how many standard deviations below or above the mean that a certain data point is. A percentile, a percentile of a certain number is what percent of the data is smaller than it. Um, to find a number in a certain percentile location, remember use that position just like we do for the median. How to find the quartiles? Well, quartiles are just the 25th and 75th percentiles. The five number summary, we found the minimum, the quartile one, median, quartile three, and the maximum. And how to find outliers and exclude them from that five number summary or from the box plot. So the effects of outliers. And then we constructed our box plot. That concludes all of our material for week three. So I'll have these recordings posted for you in a little bit. I might have some auxiliary recordings that I'll put along with them for you too.